How are you? Good. I feel, I feel so lacking because you have <laughs> such a great background. I feel so, so, so inferior at this point. How are you doing? I'm Where pretty good. You? I've never met you, but I feel like I sort of know you because um, I followed you for, for a while. So tell me who you are. So give me a sense of your background. Well, uh, I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio, and, um, you know, was a typical counterculture person in the 1970s, which led me to get interested in um, politics and Eastern religion and futurism. I've always been a science fiction fan. When I got to college, I, um, my intention was to be an expositor of Buddhist social justice stuff. Went to Sri Lanka and worked for a while uh, for a Buddhist nonprofit. Um, eventually got interested in bioethics as a kind of um, upshot of my Buddhist studies. And at graduate school at University of Chicago, um, started working on bioethics topics at the Center for Clinical Ethics, which eventually led me to be interested in the transhuman, the emerging transhumanist milieu. Um, and I kind of tagged myself as a politically progressive transhumanist at the time. A lot of transhumanists um, have libertarian leadings, so that was always a source of friction. And by the late 90s, um, I had hooked up with Nick Bostrom and some of the European transhumanists who had a more uh, open-minded approach to politics and um, became the first executive director of the World Transhumanist Association. And then was also working on a book um, that got published called Citizen Cyborg. And that book was an attempt to kind of chronicle the complicated history of transhumanist ideas and their relationship to the Enlightenment, democracy, socialism, and so forth. Um, and chart a kind of social democratic approach to um, transhumanism, which we now call the techno progressive approach. Um, there's only a couple hundred of us who use that term in the world, but it's still the, the raison d'etre for the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, which I've run for the last 15 years, which is, uh, um, includes some left transhumanists and some people who don't call themselves transhumanists, but are interested in these ideas. Um, in terms of uh, FM 2030, it, my kids were doing documentary filmmaking in the seventh grade and so I decided to make my own little documentary out of it, but I obviously didn't have very good skills. But I, I do consider FM 2030 to be quite a, a role model for the kind of futurism that he was doing. And of course, he was one of the popularizers of the term transhuman. Um, and his thinking about politics is provocative. Um, I think that a lot of uh, contemporary transhumanists are still trying to figure out if they can actually be beyond left and right the way that FM declared himself. I'm quite certain that if FM was still alive, he would be among the staunchest critics of the rise of fascism that we see around the world. And pretty clear that um, although he had hoped to be beyond left and right, that really there's not much space beyond left and right anymore. You're either on the side of the fascists or on the side of the people. So. That's where I'm at these days. But um, uh, we at the IET, we're preparing for a new uh, course of work over the next six years. We've got some funding to do work on artificial intelligence and work the impacts of artificial intelligence on national security and democracy and the uh, um, cyborg life, what, what it's going to mean to be a cyborg in the future. So we're looking forward to getting launched, those things launched. So as somebody who, who I, I guess, you didn't express this, but, but I assume that there is an optimism about the future because I don't think you would have spent this many years thinking about it and, and so on. Tell me about that as it relates to the sort of that, I mean, I think FM's often accused of, because he was a bit cavalier in some of the things, provocative is a very good term, but I think the provocations sort of belied like a real thought process. So the optimism that I think FM advocated, how do you, how much of that do you still feel, especially in light of, um, I think that difficulty in seeing beyond left and right, at least for me and certainly for you as well. 
A lot of the way that I think about the current project of the techno progressive project is what is the relationship between our thinking about the future and the imminence of certain kinds of technological changes and our moral and political uh, life. Um, the more I think about it in terms of the enlightenment as a set of memes, a set of values and ideas and different movements and time periods have different valences for those different values. So one of those values, one of those beliefs that came out of the Enlightenment was the kind of transmutation of Christian eschatology into a narrative of progress. The, the idea that we were inexorably going to move towards more social, moral, political, and technological progress. And that there is a feedback, a positive feedback loop between our technological progress and our social progress. I think that's a pretty core commitment for techno progressives, but um, and for people who, for certainly for transhumanists in general, um, but it, it also is undercut and has always been undercut by the enlightenment commitment to empiricism, which is that we have no guarantees that anything's gonna turn right uh, to, you know, go turn out right. Um, it could be that liberal democracy, you know, the kinds of freedoms that we've uh, learned to expect over the last hundred years were a brief interlude in a human history that's been dominated by various kinds of caste and class oppression. And it could be that the forms of authoritarianism, the Chinese form of authoritarianism, the, um, the neo-fascist forms of authoritarianism that we have promoted, those could be our future, right? So empirically, there's no, the, the myth of progress, the narrative of progress has nothing underpinning it except our faith. Um, it's a good faith to have, it's an optimistic faith, it keeps us moving forward. If we thought that the future was just gonna be a boot on the face, it wouldn't be well, very, right? Well, it's yeah, I mean, look, I mean, it's funny because even as you, like, I ask the question and I don't like the answer. It's funny because as you said, I find myself like summoning FM up who would have been like, yes, but, and there would have been a big but, like there are lots of benchmarks that we can point to that, that, that um, show progress. I mean, even now, even now as we decry, you know, terrible racism in the United States and, and entrenched classism and, and, and various horrible, Jingo. I mean, we see it all the time, but yet there are benchmarks. And it's funny because I sort of expected that from you rather than from me. But, I, you know, so it's, it's looking at the, these benchmarks and milestones, but also looking at the, the social environment and, and hopefully, well, you guys, because I'm not a futurist, but, but certainly looking at all these different factors and either yeah, I guess in FM's terms, because it was, I think FM often, was often accused of like making these proclamations without the substance, but also without the sort of thought. And I, I think it was very opposite. It was looking at all these different pieces, but saying we need to advocate for them. It wasn't just, oh, you know, it's going to be great because we've got an app for this and an app for that. I'm not sure what my question is, except that I'm sort of... Well, I think that's, that's the key, is that there are some people in the futurist, transhumanist, milieu who definitely are uh, unquestioning devotees of a narrative of progress. They, they don't think that, they don't take a lot of apocalyptic or dystopian anxiety seriously. And then there are those of us who take them seriously, um, think that those could be outcomes of, of hu future human history and say, no, you know, we have to take these seriously so we don't end up there and so that we end up over here and this other over here could be this utopian place. Now, when we say that, our critics think that we're just utopians, that we're just committed to the narrative of progress. And, we're, and I think your distinction is absolutely correct. It's like there's a very important uh, uh, difference between saying it's possible that we could get to this great place and saying it's absolutely certain that that's where things are. You know, as we, you know, I think, and this is a part of what I've sort of learned from the various transhumanists and people thinking about the future that I've met, and there's so many different branches, and I'm not sure, except it always reminds me of um, the Monty Python, Life of Ryan, you know, the People's Front of Judea, and, the, you, know, you know, all the different um, factions. But, 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 I've, but I've learned a lot in terms of the redefinition. I mean, I think it's a lot of this, even 
as you look into the, the sort of ethical situations, a lot of it is about how we both define ourselves, but also the redefinition of terms, not just sort of the big ones in the, in the you know, like death, redefined a bunch of times in the last 80 years, but it's also how we're, we're thinking about work, how we're thinking about um, employment, um, the economics, all of these things. What, what did, do you think are the most misused um, terms when thinking about the future and how do you think of these these different brands are these helpful in terms of getting to the getting to I don't know, the future a future that is obviously a lot better well has has different values than perhaps the ones that we're seeing play out right now well as a sociologist I it's been my um research focus for the last 30 years, and it was the theme of Citizen Cyborg, about whether there is a new um, psychological, political, ideological dimension to politics, to the way that we think about issues, things in the world, um, that was distinct from the older left-right uh, axes. And I argued in Citizen Cyborg that there was this techno-political dimension that transhumanism was one end of that and bioconservatism was the other. And the upshot of that kind of thinking was that you could theoretically end up a transhumanist and a fascist or a bioconservative and a social democrat, you know, that all these permutations were possible. I think it's becoming increasingly clear that although for micro-political reasons. Um, the San Francisco Silicon Valley milieu of transhumanism is distinctly libertarian. The dominant um, politics of the transhumanist movement has been cosmopolitan, enlightenment cosmopolitanism, you know, defense of science and technology, empiricism, secularism, um, individual liberty, reproductive freedom, et cetera, et cetera. So the, really the dimensions that we're fighting, I think are increasingly falling out so that the culturally conservative forces are seeing the things that we've thought about as in terms of transhumanism as an enemy. And um, if increasingly the people on the liberal side of the dimension will be forced to defend these kinds of technological empowerments. So I think that there's that politics is clarifying in that way, and that, that that's why I talk about the techno progressive dimension because it's a distinct um, uh, set of ideas from the libertarian view. The libertarian view is let everybody jack their bodies and their brains in without you know screw the FDA, uh, screw universal access to health care technologies and so forth. So you know if you look at FM 2030s work. I think he was writing in a period in which there was a general assumption, that, uh, just like um, the idea that liberal democracy was the end of history. His was a general assumption that there was certain kind of social democracy was going to be the end of history. He was just assuming that universal basic income and universal suffrage and equality between races and genders, that all this would become uh, logical in the future. I hope he's right. Um, but it's a fight, and it's a fight that's going on now about transgender bathrooms. I mean, if you think that um, people have to be locked into the birth that they were born in, then you're on the bioconservative end of things. And if you think that people have a right to choose what gender that they want and how do they express it, you're on the transhumanist end of things. And that's playing out in a lot of different dimensions. So um, at any rate, the, the reason I bring that up is if I take myself seriously, I think there's going to be a convergence of lots of different trends and that the um, factions of transhumanism who are uh, religious or who are libertarian will eventually uh, dry up. Um, but I don't think that that's true now. Um, obviously, they're the, big, the most uh, organized transhumanist group in the world is the Mormon Transhumanist Association, which most transhumanists prefer to ignore. Um, uh, the uh, libertarians and, and the left wingers are still battling it out. In Russia, there's three factions of transhumanists. They all consider the other ones fascist, uh, same in Italy. Um, you know, there's a lot of different subsects. And then there's the different interest groups, which is 
There's the longevists, the people who want to um, extend their personal life or life in general. And then there's the artificial intelligence people. And the artificial intelligence people have developed their own messianic sect of singularitarianism. And that has very different orientation than transhumanism over, overall. So I think all these distinctions are relevant sociologically now. I suspect that some of them will fall away and, and there'll be clarity in the future. There are so many issues to, 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 to dive into, but the, obviously the big one right now, or at least it, it almost feels like not a faux issue, because I think the issue, it, but as with most things, we tend to want to, and I say we, society, want to simplify them so they become black and white, which I understand because, you know, the, 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 as simplistic as we can get, that makes action and we can stand by that and so on. So this idea of, we're given give up our privacy um, to stop for, um, COVID, for example. We're going to, you know, these, this idea of contact tracing, etc. I mean, how much of that do you, is that a real debate? Um, give me a sense of um, that, because I think that's sort of the bottom. Well, the uh, limits of individual freedom in the future, in the first place, there's always the consequentialist argument that uh, we have to limit freedoms in order to protect everybody's freedom and everybody's well-being. Um, that's the argument for a quarantine. Um, if you don't think that quarantines are warranted, you probably also don't think that taxation's warranted. You probably also don't think military conscription's warranted. You may not agree with traffic laws. Um, but if you agree Vax with that, vaccines, any, vaccines, is that on the list? Mandatory vaccines. Sure. I yeah. mean, you, the same argument can be made for mandatory vaccines as for any other public good that has to be enforced through uh, law. And, um, and I think we will have mandatory vaccines and we should have mandatory vaccines. Hopefully they're safe vaccines. Um, mm -hmm. I, obviously this Russia, the Russians just released their, uh, Okay. testing of their vaccine it was 76 people it's like <laughs> i don't think you did it yet no. but um and trump says he's going to have a vaccine on day one of the election so all right um but yeah i think you can certainly make an argument for vaccines now the transhumanist movement as i said is a part of cosmopolitan enlightenment culture the cosmopolitan enlightenment culture asks first uh if we value everybody's personal bodily autonomy, cognitive freedom, reproductive rights highly, then what are the criteria that a state needs to meet in order to prove that restrictions on our freedom really are necessary for everybody's benefit? And I think COVID has amply demonstrated that. The places where um, you know, transhumanists tend to be far more libertarian than the public are things like reproductive rights. It's like if you argue in the abstract that abortion's okay, but people choosing what kind of gender their child should have is somehow infanticide, it's inconsistent, right? Cool. You're yeah. either for abortion rights and allowing women to choose what's in the contents of their womb, or you're not. And we, I think we're the consistent libertarians in that equation, right? So- but Yeah, um, it's so interesting. I just thought of something because it never really occurred to me. Like as, you know, with the whole design of baby, you know, it really is in this environment, the onus is on the woman. The, it's the woman's right to design, quote unquote, design the baby. I mean, I never even thought of that. I actually thought that it would be, oh, you just, two people, are woman's pregnant. We're gonna, oh, we're gonna have this discussion, but actually it falls on the woman, right? I'm just, sorry to interrupt you, but I knew I'd forget that because I'm like, that's sort of wild in a way. Well, there's a long debate in bioethics about whether fathers or gamete donors have any rights for a woman. But I think most bioethicists today, liberal enlightenment bioethicists, would argue that a woman should have the right to control the contents of her own body, and therefore those rights trump any right the gamete donor has. But um, yeah, I mean, there's issues in which uh, transhumanists or techno-progressives are going to end up far more libertarian than the general population. The distinction I would make is that techno-progressives still emphasize the importance of uh, an accountable democratic state that is empowered to ensure that technologies are safe and effective. And a, a state or a, a series of states? When you say a state, I just want to, what, what do you mean by that? I think I know what you mean by 
Well, I, I'm personally a world federalist and I look forward to a world in which um, a world, an accountable democratic world government has the monopoly of violence over all other states. Um, that I think would be a logical outcome of human history. Um, uh, in the current context, um, you know, the relevant question is how seriously should we be trying to harmonize uh, drug and device regulation around the world? You know, if Europe, uh, if the EU uh, drug authorities decide that a COVID vaccine is available in November, should the US FDA just say, we trust you, let's do that, uh, and vice versa. Those kinds of harmonizations have been worked on for decades, and they're not very close to being you know, ready for prime time. So I think we do need more of that kind of harmonization. I've Ultimately, never heard it. It's a wonderful term, and I love it, but I, don't, I'm, I actually don't know if I've ever heard it. Harmonization, that's, I think I understand it. So the, the getting together, enjoining these, these nation states, all these things in, in, a, in, a, in a jolly enterprise. Well, it's the harmonization that's been ongoing. There, there are international authorities under the auspices of the UN and the World Health Organization that attempt to say, okay, can you, are you making that drug in the same way that we make it? And could, should we just be able to buy it from you and allow it to be sold as that drug in the United States? That kind of harmonization has been going on for decades. But harmonizing clinical trial pathways and saying that the European phase one, phase two, phase three approval should be accepted as for the US FDA or vice versa or Chinese or Russian or anybody else's. That kind of harmonization hasn't happened yet and we could definitely get further in that. But um, yeah, I mean, ultimately I'd like it to be a world. Before I ask you, how do we get there? Or what are the steps do you think, what will it take to get there? The challenges that we face are obviously these ethical challenges, but also the biggest challenge that, that you pointed to are these sort of class distinctions and wealth distinctions that really remind one of a feudal age that are so not in keeping with any sort of future that I would like for me or anybody that I like or know. Um, what, are the what, are these, what are the other challenges that, that transhumanists obviously want to fix, correct, to create this better future? So although I am a transhumanist by definition and still willing to defend the term and the idea, um, I, stopped you, I stopped seeing myself as a promoter of transhumanism about seven years ago. And it was precisely around this issue. When, when Peter Thiel became a Trumpist, Epstein you know, is revealed to be a transhumanist. Um, and then in the midst of COVID, mass unemployment. Is that true? Is that true? I thought this was like, again, I did see some of that, the Epstein thing, but again, I thought it was like sort of Twitter trolls trying to sort of decry people. Who no, knows? No. He was giving money to transhumanist organizations. He was holding transhumanist soirees. He was talking about transhumanism to, and bringing together salons of scientists to talk about oh. it. Um, so, you know, we have uh, a problem. <laughs> we have an image problem at the very least. Um, for we've had that image problem all along. We've had that image problem because of eugenics, that um, people associate eugenics, even though I don't think it's appropriate because eugenics was about using state power to tell people what kind of kids they should have and transhumanism is all about individual choice. But we're still associated historically with ideas like eugenics and so forth. Um, and so for rich, white guys to, who don't give a shit about anything but their power and wealth, um, to promote transhumanism is a huge problem. And the fact that more transhumanists aren't calling that out and saying that we need to make sure that that's not the image of transhumanism. And to do more by specifically advocating for the policies of universal access that would ensure that that future doesn't get created, that's been a huge problem. That's why I am only interested in promoting my little flag of techno progressivism. But just to get to your point, yes, I think it's clear that the trends of inequality have been increasing. If you read Thomas Piketty's work, he would argue, and I think it seems logical, that um, there's an inherent tendency in capitalism towards greater wealth inequality, that inherited wealth grows at a rate faster than uh, wage wealth of working class. 
Um, as a consequence, the only way that you can prevent that kind of neo-feudalism is either massive war, massive plague, or revolutionary redistribution, which I think hopefully could be done in a democratic way in the West. But who knows? You know, we're, we're not doing very well right now in Portland, where uh, the Nazis and the left are shooting each other. So um, I think, uh, yeah, it, that the, the principal obstacle when, when Pew asks people about what they're worried about with um, life extension, artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, you scratch the surface of their anxieties and the principal anxiety is that um, they're not gonna benefit from it and the rich and powerful people will benefit from it more. Um, and, but if you ask them, well, do, if it was available, would you take a pill that would extend your life for an extra 30 years? Of course they would take the pill. The only reason that they're anxious about a future, that future is because they don't think they're gonna get it. Um, and so if we make access, universal access to enabling technologies through publicly financed um, means clear as a part of our agenda, I think we can address some of those anxieties. But that's not a part of most transhumanist agenda. That's a wonderful idea. I mean, getting people, I mean, so much of this, as I, as I talk to people, you know, in some ways is just marketing, you know, it, the terminologies, the, the things that are being sold and how they're being sold are just tantamount to ba either bad or good marketing, depending on what you look at. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's when people, you know, act out of their own, um, what do sociologists call when um, the, the dissonance between people's actual needs and wants to their behavior? There's a sociological term. False consciousness. I think that's, well, well, that wasn't something I was thinking about, but that, that definitely applies. So this, it is a silly question, I know, but like, if, if you had to sort of mark your, your levels of optimism in solving certain problems, you know, it, whether it be climate change or po poverty or the sort of, um, what we've just been talking about, the, the, um, the disparity between rich and poor, even, the, even the absurd notions that certain things like universal basic income or, or universal um, health care is, is, is communism. Um, how do we, um, not as a transhumanist for sure, but as a, just as a human being, which of these things do you think are closest to being solved? I mean, and I'll give one last thought, because I think people often forget this when talking about FM. I mean, FM didn't just say, oh, we're going to live forever in 2030. He said that we need sort of these foundations of optimism, abundance, universalism, and then we could sort of tackle this, this longevity question. Well, you're a better FM scholar than I am. But uh, yes, my overall impression of the corpus of his work is that he could have paid a little bit more attention to the political economy that needed to be created to to bring the, the vision into fulfillment. But in terms of the things that are closest, I, the, the parts of the transhumanist agenda that is most popular is the life extension part of it. And um, as with many forms of um, tra what's called transcendentalized technological progress. So, you know, if, if you, there's no alternative medicine, there's just medicine and not medicine. Uh, in the same way, there's no transhumanist medicine. As soon as something becomes a real medicine, it's medicine. It's, yeah. not, it's not a transhumanist technology anymore. So as soon as we actually prove that taking metformin every day lengthens your life or uh, CRISPR tweaking your mitochondria lengthens your life, that's just gonna be a therapy. Um, and most people want that th those therapies and um, support for research into those kinds of therapies has been more or less bipartisan. So hopefully that will continue. Um, I think that's the closest part, uh, radical life extension. But that leads into other crises that have to be addressed. One is if, as people live longer. Right now, people are not living longer, right? Over the last five years in the United States, life expectancy has stalled or begun to decline on the part of many parts of the population clearly linked to economic insecurity related to this late stage form of capitalism that we're in. The rise of suicide, alcoholism, uh, opiate abuse, 
all of this and cults and conspiracy theories, all of it is as a, a part of a piece of the crisis that we're in right now. And it's, and it's blocking our progress towards extending life expectancy. Now technology may be a techno fix in there at some point, but um, still we have to make sure it's universally accessible, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, that, that piece I think is relatively accessible. Um, artificial intelligence is gonna have a huge impact on, and is already here in this COVID year, uh, having a huge impact on accelerating the trends of technological redundancy for a lot of kinds of occupations. And uh, this Andrew Yang tried to raise this issue to his credit in the presidential campaign, the need for universal basic income to transition away from depending on work for income. Um, and I think that issue is pretty clear and you know, Spain is adopting a universal basic income. People around the world have had limited forms of universal basic income in reaction to COVID. I think it's gonna be pretty clear in the coming decade or two as the labor market becomes much more constrained because of technology that we need these kinds of reforms. Um, that's not necessarily part of the transhumanist agenda, but you're, if you lose your job to a robot, it's definitely gonna have an effect on the way that you think about the future and technology. And um, the, if we can make that transition as seamless and as comfortable as possible for people, we reduce these kind of counterproductive conspiracy theory Luddite reactions. Um, in terms of other kinds of modifications, I mean, Elon Musk, love him or hate him, I, he's, you know, I, I generally don't like evil lair billionaires, but um, Elon Musk seems to be a little bit more on the side of the angels than the devils. And his Neuralink experiment, um, although there's a lot of, you know, this kind of research has been going on for 30 years, he's building off of a long corpus of brain machine interface research, but he's trying to make it universally accessible with common ingredients and, you know, God bless him. So I think it may be that we're on the cusp of doing actual brain machine interfaces. But aside from that, we're doing so much with wearables and hopefully soon glasses because I was all geared up to get my Google glasses and then they disappeared. Um, but I think we'll be doing a lot more around the head than we'll be doing directly in the head. But that's, I think, pretty accessible as well. So I think on all fronts, transhumanism is moving forward. The principal problem is who's it going to empower? Is it going to be safe? Um, are people going to freak out about the social consequences because they don't trust how it was rolled out and who has access to it? And that's why we need a clear social democratic agenda around all these things. Well, how confident are you without the regulations, without even the intelligence, in, 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 I say intelligence, knowledge from our elected officials to... to um, not so much the data that, that people will develop from Google Glasses, but having, um, having the, th these technology companies, not just in charge of the data, but actually on the front lines of delivering all of this, which has both obvious consequences and perhaps not so obvious consequences. Well, obviously, uh, a lot of the 90s enthusiasm, uh, you know, the techno utopianism that thought that everything from the internet was going to be groovy and empower everybody and, you know, be free source and we were all going to share our, our music files, you know, all of that has gone by the wayside. It's clear that this landscape is as much a terrain of class struggle and corporate power and military influence and cyber warfare and terrorism and crime as everything else was. Um, it's just, you know, the electronic version of our daily world. So um, we need to have the same kinds of skepticism and regulatory um, interventions. Uh, you know, California is now considering their own version of the GDPR, the, the European data regulations. Europe has much stronger protections for individual data and they've been on the war path against American tech giants for a while. Um, I think the technolash clearly has its limits. Most people are not ready to give up. I'm not ready to give up my use of Google or Apple or Amazon or Facebook. I mean, I still use them every day and, I'm, and I don't think it's wrong for people to use them. We all live in this society, but I would like to see them better regulated. And I'm glad that there's a strong um, bipartisan consensus that they're not doing right by the world. The cult of personality it's not even that like this is a very i i 
anyone else I could sort of see. I met Steve Bannon, I interviewed Steve Bannon, really very scary individual, but smart. And how do we explain- We, we dodged a bullet. When Steve Bannon got kicked out of the White House, we dodged a bullet because I think if Bannon had been running the Trump strategy, uh, we would be in a lot worse situation. Yeah, he was, he was enormously smart, but when I, and I went, he was very put together. Now he looks like he's, he's done, something's gone wrong, not just the Trump aspect of things, but yes. Well, it's a culture of grift. I mean, they're, they're all in it for making a buck, so. How did we get, how, well, not how did we get there, because I think we've always been there, but um, I, I feel like I know how FM would have explained the rise of some of these people. How do you explain it? What's your sort of sense of what's happened? And in, in thinking about what's happened, how do we, we come out? Some it's of a whole can of worms. I'll just say, I, you know, I've been a socialist since I was a teenager. And part of, as a sociologist, um, part of my interest has been with theories of historical change and how we account for how things happen. Um, I'm... I would say I'm a historical materialist, although not an economistic Marxist. Uh, in other words, I think sex, gender, the state, um, the economy, and our culture and racial relations, all of these have their own dynamics and their own causative um, agendas. So anyway, the upshot is I think if, if you try to say, why did Trump win? Uh, you know, you look at the districts that flipped from Obama to Trump. It's clear that racism is a part of it. Um, there's uh, a, a strong racialist uh, agenda that's been clear throughout the Trump regime. White supremacy is a thing. Um, and um, a lot of white people voted for him because of white supremacy. Um, it's also gender. It's that um, Hil Hillary was a woman, Trump was uh, toxic masculinity embodied, um, and so a lot of men voted for him, and women who believe in that kind of masculinity voted for him as well. Um, it was also class and corporate power. The corporate elite were giving like 10 times, 20 times as much money to Hillary as they were to Trump. But when it comes down to it, the uh, whenever fascism makes this kind of an emergence, um, it is a co-optation of working class cultural reactionary politics in the support of ruling class policy. And that's what we saw this time. I mean, Trump said he was going to defend Social Security and Medicare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then train the swamp. Yeah, train, the swamp. train the swamp. And then as soon as he gets into office, it's like every lobbyist is in there as the head of an agency. Uh, it's all about deregulation and tax cuts for the rich. And yeah, we, let's actually talk about cutting Medicare and Social Security because that's part of the old Republican agenda. So anyway, it's clearly in the service of the ruling class. They're perfectly happy to use neo-Nazis if that's what it takes to protect their profits. So I think it's a, there's multifactorial. I wouldn't you know, just say it's that. It's also race and, and gender. Uh, but, but I wouldn't say it's just race and gender either. I think it's also class. The, the myth, what did you call it? I think you call it the myth of the, the, pro, the, pro, the progressive notion of the Renaissance. You had some phrase that, that was- that, Narrative that of was, progress. Yes, this, the, the narrative of progress that was, prom, that I think what you said was promised by the Renaissance was a myth. And, and but to me, the, the myth is, that, is, is this bump, is the, the bump of the, the fascists or the people that want to remove all these things that, that if, if they want 100%, right? We certainly were thinking about climate change, and we were thinking about we were thinking about people that weren't normally thought about in in human history. And now we're we're, we're you know exactly what you said. We're we've got the, a lot of them, not just Trump, but in other parts of the world as well. You know, with this mantle, and it's more that how do we? Um, because I'm not going to put you in the camp of the transhumanist. I'm going to put you in the camp of a progressive, or you know. Um, somebody who wants a more fair future for, for everybody, not just themselves. I mean, that's to me the most that has, that, that ascribes to some of the technology that will help in that, not is the, the answer. So as, at, you know, as we see this, to me, it should, it, the promise of all this technology was that we would be able to spot these charlatans more quickly. I mean, 
you know, and that, and, and if anything, it's been the opposite of that. We've, we've, we've enabled charlatans to promulgate their bile much easier. And so I guess, it, what is the promise of things like, you know, again, these, some of these things are tech, technological, well, feels like there are technologies that can aid in bringing us back to sort of a fact-based, well, I don't know if we ever were in a fact-based society, well, but we I think that's the key point. And I think this, throughout my interventions into futurism over the last 25 years, um, one of the overriding themes is that most futurists, like most people, are ahistorical. They don't understand history. And if you look at the history of technological expectations, you see the same stories over and over again. You know, when the telegraph wires are being strung across the United States 150 years ago, people were saying, this will be the end of war. When people in Beijing can instantly communicate with people in New York, why would people fight wars? And it's like, um, so, you know, you, these same expectations and these same uh, pessimisms, you know, you see right before every major technological breakthrough, people saying that technological breakthrough is impossible. No one will ever buy it. No one will ever need it. Um, so at any rate, I, I think a historicity in terms of politics and a historicity in terms of technology really doesn't serve us very well. If you look uh, at the history of political things, um, certain themes keep coming back up. And, um, you know, when capitalism goes into crisis and people tend to get uh, riled up about immigration and cultural minorities and they get scapegoated, these things come up over and over again. So, yeah, I, I do believe, uh, let me just say, I have defended Pinker to my students and my peers. I think Pinker, you know who I'm talking about, Stephen Pinker, he's yeah. um, an advocate for a model of progress, which is empirically based. I do think it's absolutely true that, um, our, that our contemporary society, the risk of, being, of dying a violent death is distinctly lower than it was for our ancestors, and it's gotten lower every century that we can measure. Um, that's progress. And, I, and I'm glad to live in a society where I have an 80-year life expectancy instead of a 30-year life expectancy, where I'm literate instead of illiterate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, uh, and I believe that all those things are legitimate if you define them as progress. But as I say to my students, ISIS doesn't think they're progress, right? Not everybody agrees that those are progress, right? If, you th if your definition of progress is how much we're living according to Sharia, then all of those things are relevant. So there's no self-evident nature to the progress that we adduce, right? Yeah, no, you're 100% you're, you're, you're right. Yet, yet there are, for, and China's the weirdest paradox because most of the Chinese, even in, on the mainland, certainly the ones that are coming here, that are these entrepreneur class, I'm not even talking about the billionaires, I'm talking about there is this entrepreneur class married with this sort of communist veneer and you know which on the one hand enables them to actually be responsive and do certain things in a much more efficient but obviously not particularly um fair or fair way and and i think you said this early early on in the conversation i think one of the first things you said we don't know who's going to win this sort of battle we don't and but 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 the chai and i don't know if you have any, uh, any um, insight into this, but it is interesting how individual Chinese will almost mirror in terms of wants, for, in terms of the wants of some Americans, and yet it's, they're not, they're not, they don't have the same protections, etc. I mean, it is strange. Yeah, I, my first year in college, I intended to go and do research in the People's Republic and I studied Mandarin and I lived in the East Asian dorm and um, I continue to have an engagement with China and I'm very interested in the things that are happening there. I think the current Chinese state has revealed itself to be not only a form of totalitarian capitalism, but a form of racist totalitarian capitalism, um, whether that's fascism or not, I leave to the, to the pedants, but um, they've got a million Uyghurs in prison camps. That's on top of their mistreatment of their other dozen ethnic minorities over the last 50 years. Uh, a, a practice that they have called out internally as Han, Han chauvinism since the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. 
So, um, yeah, I think it's extremely troubling that in this current world, they have the, both the wealth and the political ambition and the technocratic efficiency to promote their, um, not only their form of government, but also the technologies that underlie that form of government, the kind of surveillance state that they're building. And that surveillance state, uh, as I'm sure you know, has developed a gamification aspect around the Sesame credit score system that is truly terrifying. It's black mirror dystopia. Um, they're basically monitoring not only how you spend your time, whether you play too much video games or take care of your kids or buy too, many, too much alcohol, all of that's going into your credit score. What you say online goes into your credit score. What your friends say online goes into your credit score. It's basically, you know, it's totalitarianism. So I think to the degree to which the Chinese model becomes dominant in the world is the end of liberal democracy. We, we really have to see it as an existential threat. I mean, yeah, that, I mean, it's frightening. But, and it, but do you think there's a chance because there is this, I mean, the, the sort of balance between these people that want, want all the bells and whistles of capitalism and want the sort of milieu and culture, they like the culture. I mean, these are the people that I'm in track and I've spoken to them on lots of these things of late because everyone's been locked in. I mean, I mean, I always thought that media and culture would create this sort of um, fondness for the things that I think are progress and freedom and so on. But now I'm not so sure, especially when I hear them and then they have their whole eyes closed off in terms of well, what's going on in Hong Kong. You know, what do you think of this? And they're like, oh, well, what they need because of, you know, there's all this rationalization. And I just think there's a, it, I think it's very, in, as a, somebody who likes to see contradictions and likes, is interested by contradictions. I do find it interesting. And I wonder, I, my hope is that, that this affinity for the culture will get them to look at these other aspects. But perhaps I'm being overly optimistic. Yeah, I mean, in terms of individual freedom, they obviously are interested in, um, controlled but ex expans expansion of certain kinds of freedoms that people will be pacified by. But I, I pay more attention to the other more challenging aspects of the Enlightenment cosmopolitan tradition, such as sex, gender, freedom. And it's fascinating to me that under the Cultural Revolution and uh, the earlier periods of Maoism, um, women workers as industrial workers or farm workers were being celebrated. Um, and now, uh, since the 80s, since the turn towards the right under Deng Xiaoping, um, there's been a real denigration of women who refuse to accept traditional gender roles and get married and have lots of uh, children for the state. They're called leftover women if they're single by the, by the time they're 30. And this is in a context where they're, because of sex selective abortion, there's 20 million fewer women than men, right? If anything, it's leftover men that are the problem in China right now. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has recently declared the invasion of androgynous ideas from other from outside China to be a threat to the masculinity of Chinese men. They're on a war path against homosexuality. Um, you know, I, it's pretty clear that the Chinese regime is reverting to a traditional right wing authoritarian form of government. And they're closely in bed now with their billionaire class um, who have all uh, invested their money in Vancouver and Toronto, New York. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's part of the world capitalist system and the part of the world ruling class at this point. I don't think that there's a progressive nature to the Chinese state anymore. Oh, I didn't expect you to be so scary right now. Um, I'm going to move because I know two last questions. I'm not even sure what the time is, but I was having fun. So, but, so I apologize if I've gone over. But, um, Mind uploading, or I know I hate putting these as binary questions, but, but I, I'm being slightly provocative, but mind uploading or cryonics, which, what which, about which, oh. which of the, the it's, um, a, it's a bit of a provocative question, but I've noticed that people in this, in the, the world, the milieu, like to sort of stake out one or the other, which I'm not sure is exactly right, but, but what do you think of either? Yeah, I don't, I don't see them as a binary choice. Um, I think um, cryonics, the problem with cryonics is that the technologies that it would require to do right, um, we're at a very crude stage right now, being able to, 
we're, we're beyond just freezing, which was terrible. We're now at vitrification, which is turning the brain into a kind of glass, glassy substance, which we don't know how to unpack yet, but it, there's less tissue damage involved. Um, it would still need molecular nanotechnology, molecular nanorobotics to do what people are imagining. And it probably would be a destructive process, but it would, at least if we had this frozen picture of the brain, whatever information we can get out of that, we might be able to upload that later. So the two are intimately connected, if you believe in that particular trajectory, that cryonics will only really work through uploading. Um, but uh, I think uploading likewise requires uh, a couple billion nanobots in your head. and what Musk has just released is uh, a plug that has like a thousand leads on it and just on the surface of your brain. He said you could do a couple of them if you want, um, you know, one on the right, one on the left, one on the back, whatever. Uh, but that's still only a couple thousand leads. It's not the billions that you would need in order to have fully immersive virtual reality or back, backing up your memories or uh, you know, the other kinds of cognitive enhancements that we would imagine from that technology. So. Um, both trajectories uh, require advancing molecular scale nanotechnology. Um, and by the time we get that kind of nanotechnology that makes a lot of people say, oh, I should freeze myself so I can wake up in the future because these technologies are real, you won't need them anymore. You won't need to freeze yourself because if you got cancer, it's, there won't be an incurable cancer if we have that technology, right? There won't be a heart defect that you need to freeze yourself to get fixed later. It will be fixable now. So I just don't see cryonics as something that has a long-term future to it. Personally, I've never signed up for it because my wife would be pissed off at me if I did. So. That's a very good reason. So, um, Ken Hayworth, and who I love, adore. He's a wonderful, wonderful person. And if you're not aware of him, you should be. He's a neuroscientist, he's amazing. But he not only um, created this prize that would um, basically put cryonics and the cryonic methods um, in a rigorous scientific approach to them. And he created this prize. But anyway, he believes that we can um, create these basically snapshots of our brain, we're very, very close to being, being able to do that in, in a way that in the future that will, um, could be uploaded, that they will retain all the connectomes and, and so on and so forth. And um, he really believes that should be offered to anybody that is on their way out as part of, as, as, as a choice so that they can be reanimated once we have the, the computer With power. With the caveat that I am a social scientist and not a neuroscientist, and I'm not even sure most neuroscientists would have good opinions on these things, but um, connectomics, the simple idea that you could take a picture of how things are wired together and then boot that up as a functioning model of the person's consciousness has never made any sense to me. It, 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 the, it is akin to me to saying, if I had a street map of New York, I could tell you, how the election was going to work out of the New York mayor or something. No, the street map, yes, the street map's a part of what happens in New York, but it's all those people moving in and out and what they do over time that actually allows you to, to see New York thinking and New York breathing. So I think the brain's the same way. It's going to take embedded nanotechnology over a long period of time to build up the model of your consciousness that would be uploadable. It's not just something you can do from a frozen brain. And again, I'm not, I'm not doing it justice. So I'm going to send it, I'm going to send you, but who knows, but he's, and he's one of the most rigorous people in the, that I've met in these sorts of fields. That, and, and who's a, certainly an advocate of a lot of the things that I think you and I share and probably things I don't share. But. Well, God, God bless everybody who's doing research in that direction. I think it will help. Yeah. I mean, uh, from what I understand of FM's particular interment, um, probably won't make any difference because it wasn't done very effectively. Yes, I think, um, like somebody said, last in, last out. And, you know, by the time they actually have the technology to fix all the damage that's done, I mean, it's probably not, yeah. But look, uh, the, this was a, you know, the, the act of making this film in some ways was uh, wanting to sort of keep, at least keep some of his ideas alive for sure. So my last question, I don't know if you've seen, you've seen the show Upload. 
it's actually quite good, I think. It's funny. Is it a documentary? Or, oh, no, no, no you mean the TV series. TV yes, show, I yeah. have. Yes, right, yeah. Did you enjoy I, it? I did enjoy it. And actually, we have a science fiction um, discussion group in the philosophy department at my university. And, we, and I recommended it to them because I thought it was a very techno-progressive take on things. Instead of uploading being the problem as it would be in most science fiction, um, uploading is just assumed to be a part of their universe. And then the, and the real question was capitalism. Was, is yeah. it gonna be a Disneyland version of uploading or is it gonna be a free source uh, version of uploading public good? Um, and I think that's a fantastic question. I think the comedy, that, that particular question was not as engaging for my colleagues and they didn't appreciate some of the comedy, but if you ever so, went their own, you know. I loved it. I thought it was really well done. I, I liked the comedy. I thought some of the questions were the right questions and, and some of the, the wrong questions were funny enough for me to ignore them. Um, but in thinking about that, if you were able to upload yourself into an environment, whether it was a way station for, for further explorations of the universe, what would that look like, feel like? What would that, what would you want it to be? Well, I th again, I think upload um, and similar genre shows today, uh, there are a lot of them now, um, they pose the right question, which is you would want to know what your existence was going to be like. Um, are you going to be able to work, own property, vote, uh, hold, maintain relationships? Are you going to be able to control the, how your body looks? I mean, the idea that in the uh, premium upload space that, that, that was depicted in that particular show, this, uh, this shishi version of uploading, you wouldn't be able to fix your hair. I mean, why, why would that be a feature, right? Um, and if people are allowed to work from that upload space when they could work a lot faster, a lot more effectively with the right kind of resources, there's no cognitive enhancement available in that space. Why, why would you know, the Koch brother guy who's in that show, he's just sitting around like a regular human being. Presumably he could have uh, added you know, 10, 20, 30 times more processor space and he could be a super villain genius in that space. So, all of those are critical questions. How equal will we be? How, how will our rights be affected? Will people treat us as human beings or as simple uh, digital laborers? I think those are all the key questions. Thank you. I mean, I could talk to you all day, but, I, but, but this was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. And it's so good. To, I, I was not intimidated is the wrong word, but I, because all the pictures I've seen of you, I mean, this was, you're, you're, you look very, well, you look very dapper, but, but also very, not conservative as much as, more how I um, see a university professor. I was like, oh, but you're not. So that's, that's um, yeah. I'm an see? old hippie. You're an old hippie, yeah, just in a suit for, for, the, for the headshots, which right. you have to do for the, for the board, for, hopefully for the, the boards of companies that you, you sit on. Hopefully it's for that rather exactly. than... Thank you very much indeed. It was a lot well, of fun. Well, thank you for working on this project. Um, FM needs and deserves all the attention that he can get.